Hey, I'm, a, I'm Dan Radigan. I'm the senior manager of Adobe Type Development. I work with the uh, Adobe Type team, who you may have heard something about our Adobe Fonts project that just happened. Um, uh, the mission of my team is to work on the typefaces. We produce the Adobe Originals, which are about showing what's possible with typefaces. So we try to do comprehensive families and dig into what's happening next with typeface technology. That's some of the stuff that I want to get into today, show you a little bit about things that are in development and some thoughts about how we hope that'll work and what we hope you can do with the technology that's coming. Um, we care about a lot of this stuff because we think typography is really important. This is some of the stuff that we've been talking a lot about with the Adobe Fonts project because we think that um, typography is like the, the, it's the visual embodiment of the language that we all use. Typography gives you personality and emotion and tone um, and it helps you do things. And it's the leanest way that you can um, really like connect um, words to a reaction, to emotions. Um, it's a very simple element that can be really, really powerful. Um, if you are a graphic designer, visual designer, UX, motion, any kind of designer, you probably had, have had experience about having to make choices about typeface and really figure out how to make typefaces do what you need them to do to create an experience. Uh, um, and sometimes you have the fewest elements to work with. This is a project for um, a theater organization in New York who I worked with for many years where their brand guidelines that had been set up by another designer specified one typeface family that had a couple of weights. But they put on 30 different productions a year with different artists. And I had to really wrangle as much out of that typeface as humanly possible and get this limited palette to link all of these different things together. Which is an example of what you can do with typography if you put your energy into it. But it also highlights a lot of the challenges of working with fonts as the way we've been used to using them for all these years. Um, you probably also realize, even if you're not a designer, just as a consumer, as a participant in our culture, we can use type to connect to different things that we see. These are all brands that are really, really easy to spot just because you're familiar with the shapes of these letters. You could probably see one or two letters out of these and connect to it, identify it. That's part of the power of type, which is why we think it's important and we're excited when we figure out more ways of working with type. Um, and the thing is, it's the working with type that's actually the important part about this because typefaces are one thing, but they're just static um, and they come alive when we make decisions about setting type and working with it and building these associations and when you add something else to what the typeface is already giving you to work with. Um, and these are some of the reasons like why type is such a big deal. I mean like look at me, I'm a huge nerd, I'm super into type and typefaces. Um, but it's because it can do so much. It can be very explicit. It can help you do things, it's the vehicle for communication um, and it can make that easier or harder depending on the choices you make but it's also like that that implicit stuff the emotional stuff that's hard to pinpoint but you know when you've nailed it or you know when it's wrong not just in your own work but in the work that you see around it being able to learn how to control this stuff is what sort of the your development as a designer is all about um, and a lot of the things that I want to talk about are the ways that we're trying to make it easier for, get, for you to get to that place where you're making the decisions that really count. Your creative decisions, your decisions to personalize things, rather than just your workflow decisions about how to get something laid out. Um, uh, but let's back up a little bit and say, what is good typography? It's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot, but that's a very like murky, ambiguous phrase, right? Um, for a long time, like hundreds of years, stuff like this was considered good typography. An easy to read passage of text, maybe something like a headline for a bit of wayfinding within a text. Um, and in some fashion or another, this sort of formula, I want to read it, I want to see it, it's probably pretty static, it's printed, was what typography was. And a lot of rules and conventions developed around it. 
But the reality is we don't read the same way. Typographic conventions were honed over hundreds of years where the reading experience was quite similar. But this may be more how we take in information now, through a mixture of printed things, digital things, digital things of different scales, and a lot of it even happening at the same time or moving from one to the other. So the challenges of what typefaces need to do are very different. And we're still in, I think, very early stages of exploring what's different and important about those. Um, with the explosion of working with type and text in the digital space, we've already seen how important it is to adapt what we think about design and practice of typography. Um, in the early days of when the web was becoming about things moving into the mobile space or even like you know monitors of different sizes it was clear that it didn't work to approach things the same way you didn't design something once and then throw it at all of these different screens because it just didn't work it felt forced and artificial and often fell apart in all these different contexts and so responsive design was a great leap forward in realizing that the design that we do for digital spaces ought to flex to hit these. It should be like water. It should take on the shape of the vessel that it goes into. Um, and with all of those variables that can happen, where the, the shape changes, the medium changes, things as simple as type and color became more important than ever as some of the most basic ways that you could associate something from one device to another, one medium to another. Photos could be very tricky. Um, they could take up a lot of data, but type color. These things came through. Even before we had web fonts, using system fonts very carefully allowed you to build these associations. That responsive element of getting things to flex was a major addition to how you could get this to work. Things just had to feel the same everywhere. They didn't have to look the same everywhere. Um, and the result of that is a better experience in each moment for people, right? That's what you really want. You don't want what you see on a phone to look just like it would on a monitor, but you want to feel like someone is engaging with the same stuff and they're having the same conversation. Um, brands that are, and I shouldn't say brands because I don't want to talk about this just in a commercial sense, but anyone who wanted to really have a conversation of the same tone, despite the medium, had to really wrap their heads around how you get it to feel the same in all these different contexts. And type was a really great way of doing that because it was the most flexible, the most mutable. Um, but you were still stuck within some of the parameters of what you could do with fonts, the way that um, they behave. Um, and these these conventions that we work with and that we've sort of learned to start picking apart as our media have been becoming more diverse, um, the old conventions still apply, but you may have to rethink them and think critically about how they work in a different kind of environment, but they still make sense. We can look at a book from the 15th century and recognize it in a pattern that makes sense to how we read today. Um, you know, that is, that is a similar architecture, a similar way of your eyes moving around a page, at least for, you know, Western languages, um, that we can, that we can get. This is Latin and Greek, but you probably know how to figure out where to start reading in this, even if you don't speak those languages. The typefaces that we've been using for over half a millennium now are pretty much like the convention sort of fell into place, and we've been working with iterations of them. Now, there's been a lot of room for evolution and diversity of ideas, but we can recognize something this old and it still makes sense. So the practice of typography is this mixture of drawing on what we as a culture have learned to identify about reading and interacting with words, but figuring out how it applies to what we do now. Um, and the actual practice of making type has adapted to um, the moment of the time and the technological needs all along the way and we've learned a lot of lessons along the way. We've lost some in some of these shifts from one version to another. Um, this is a drawing of uh, what the letters looked like for Times New Roman when it was made in metal type. Now metal type is like one to one. You made a physical thing, it was pressed into ink on a page um, and for it to feel like Times New Roman it had to actually look very different 
at every size. It's a little bit like what we say about responsive design. You want it to feel the same even though all the details may have to change at the given moment. Physical type was the same way. You manipulate all the details, but it still felt like a page of text in Times New Roman. That's something that went away um, in like other eras of type development, but the knowledge still applies, and maybe we can get back to that. Um, and that's just one example of how technology impacts typography, which is why we keep pushing the technology forward. And for all that I'm ranting on about type and how great type is, the reality is what's really special is the performance of text. Like, the reason that I like working with digital type and the reason why I like having software to work on these things, even if I'm making something for print, is that text is really, really powerful as a fluid thing. Words communicate a lot, and we know that words have power. We talk a lot about how words have power. But digital text adds so much else to the experience of your possible interaction with words. Just think about it. If you have text, you can edit it, you can stretch it, you can scale it, you can zoom in, you can select it to do things like copy and paste or highlight things. Um, digital text is accessible. If you have any kind of vision impairment or anything that gets in the way of you reading something with your eyes, digital text allows you to get past that and make that experience open to more people. You can search it. So you can build databases like Google. It makes it easy to find things. You can translate it to make the messages go to languages. That's all stuff you can't do with a one-to-one -one printed image of like type on a page. You can do all these things to get to type on a page, which makes the workflow easier. But the real possibility is these digital spaces where you can you can really get all of this extra stuff in addition to just a word and what it looks like. So to that end, I really think a lot about how type can be more than just the visual expression of words, a fixed thing. I think that type should be as flexible as what you know the bits of data that make up digital text can be. Um, and again, this is where we get past just selecting fonts and choosing what fonts look like and thinking about what they can do. So what is a font? I keep talking about fonts um, and how there are some limitations and how we've lost some things and how we're trying to get some, some stuff back. But let's think about what that is. A digital font, as we have it today, is essentially like a kind of database. It's not real software. It doesn't execute something on its own. It is a file that contains pictures of letters and then bits of information about those letters, like Unicode values or their dimensions, um, copyright information. But it's like a database of pictures of letters. That's really helpful. So. What if we can put more stuff in that database? Can we make fonts do more if they can contain more kinds of information? You might guess. I think the answer is totally yes, right? OK, let's get into it. So one of the developments that have come along in a couple years that my colleagues at Adobe and colleagues at other companies and other foundries have worked on is what we call OpenType SVG. So presumably you're kind of familiar with the word open type. That's the file format that we say when we talk about contemporary fonts. We've had open type in some fashion for about 20 years now. Open type SVG is adding another layer of information onto an open type font. Scalable vector graphics, the stuff that holds color, transparency, image effects. These fonts say, well, let's layer that other kinds of image, image data on top of the black image of a glyph that we're used to. And you can do great things with it. Um, so they can do great things with regular fonts as we know them. Um, they don't have to be totally static or they don't have to feel static. So this typeface, um, Opulent Brush by Sam Parrott, um, looks like a really, really lively, ornate script. It feels like something that's not digital, but really, this is a font. It's a digital thing. What we can do with SVG is add another layer of illusion to this. This is a font with the transparency in there, with the gradients. 
it gives it a more pictorial feel. That's something else into the font. And it allows you to like create other effects without having to know about like Photoshop filters or layers or masking. The font itself becomes a tool for getting you further along into making that image, provoking that emotion, making that connection for the people who see something. Um, and there are other fonts that can do this. The big thing about SVG um, that a lot of folks are excited about is that it can have multiple colors. So it's not like where you just take a font and you select some text and apply a color to it, but you can have this mixing within a single letter, within a single line of text, and that can all build up and you can get, so this is like a simpler way of getting this. And yeah, you could have done all this in Illustrator or something where you like, flatten things to paths and apply colors, but you can edit this, copy it, scale it, make it accessible. This is live text with all of that pictorial power of an illustration. Emoji made this happen. Emoji had been an explosive idea in our culture, um, and there was a race to figure out what's the best way to make emoji available to people. Well, the easiest way um, was to have bitmap pictures. Um, it was just the easier technology to work out. So for the most part, most of the emoji that we have on our phones um, are delivered as these bitmap based fonts. Because usually you see them like in a phone or in a messaging app, you don't need a big emoji, it just needs to like work at that scale. But you can't blow up something made of pixels because you see the pixelization. With scalable vector graphics, you can blow it up and you can do more with that format than just see it at a fixed scale in a messaging app. So that was like the next leap that it took a little bit um, longer to sort out. Um, and this is what is really big about SVG fonts. It was kind of a way of solving one problem that there's a demand for, you know, the delivery of these like fun little pictures that people wanted to communicate with. And you take that idea to another level and say, actually, it can be so much easier to give words that same kind of pictorial um, variety um, and punch. Um, when ha while still getting like the flexibility and the ease of text. So that's really, really super. And you can play with this stuff now. We've had um, OpenType SVG and Illustrator and Photoshop, more web browsers supporting it. You could start using it in InDesign as of yesterday. And you should. There's some fonts in there that you can play with. And I totally encourage you to try it out. But what's even bigger, and I totally have a bias about this, I think this next step is really exciting, are what we call variable fonts. So. Going back to this idea of, the font, of a font file being a kind of a database, think of a font family. It's a whole bunch of files, each is a database, each of those holding one style of a typeface design. With variable fonts, this technology is about saying, actually, if these pictures of letters are all scalable vectors, what if we hold in the font file the information to transform each of those letters from one style in the family to the other style. If we can do that, it doesn't mean that you don't just get light and bold, but you can get everything in between. You can get everything between condensed or skinny and wide. Um, and you throw away all the redundant information by just getting into one package. So you get a smaller size, but with more functionality, more stuff you can do, more flexibility. This is another big idea. Um, we, the kind of terminology we use around variable fonts, and a lot of this is early, so we're still stuck with sort of jargon as we describe these. And a lot of type designers are trying to figure out how to shed the jargon to make it easier to understand. But we say that the variable font, you get to use the entire design space. What we mean is that you get all of the styles that the type designer prepared, but also all of the styles in between those fixed points that you would have seen in the font menu earlier. That's the design space, that all of the possibilities within the edges of possibility as designed by a typeface designer. That means it's okay to stretch and distort or do different kinds of transformations without really getting these like visually um, awkward distortions. You're doing all this, getting this flexibility um, with what's that has been thought out um, and designed by the type designer, who is like the person you want to trust to do that so they can trust you to do the work that you understand really well. Um, so this is where we get into like the stuff that they tell you never to do. I'm going to do a quick online 
demo to show you how some of this stuff works. Um, so last year, Photoshop and Illustrator um, added the capability to play with variable fonts. Um, you may have seen some, some things appear in the font menu if you've used these in the last year. You may have seen people talk about these on the web. But to give you an idea of what I mean about how you get the flexibility, you can take a font. So this is uh, Adobe Acumen by my colleague Robert Slimbach. Um, when you select a variable font in Photoshop, you see in the properties panel that you get these sliders. Um, that allow you to control different properties for that typeface. And they may be different from one typeface to another. If I click on my minion text down here, I get weight and optical size. Acumen has uh, width, weight, and slant. I love, by the way, the fact that I can just like double click on this text now to make it work. So thank you to my smart colleagues at Photoshop for finally doing that after 20, 25 years. Um, but look what happens as I play with these sliders. I can get all of the weights. Acumen is a 90 style font family. This is Acumen as one font that lets you work out all these combinations, including all the stuff you didn't get out of the static font family. Say with, a, with Acumen, for instance, you had Roman or you had Italic. But what if you just wanted to give it a couple degrees? You could make that happen within a variable font version. Um, Minion, um, where, there, where there has like a sort of a small weight range from regular to bold, but Minion is more about those optical styles, those adjustments like I was showing in the Times New Roman slide that make it feel the same at different scales. So you can take Minion and you can make it right for when it's really small or get the super elegant high contrast version that it's supposed to look like when it's very big. And all of these spaces in between. And you can do the same thing in Illustrator. Same principle, slightly different interface, but you get all the controls. You can decide what you want it to look like. You can work with these objects the same way you would have. All that fun stuff. Live text. Easy to edit, easy to tweak to get it to work the way you want it to work because these are transformations happening with the font technology itself. Yay! Um, I really get excited about this and I realize it's kind of embarrassing, but I have to own what a nerd, nerd I am about this stuff. So, it looks cool, it looks very dramatic to drag those sliders around and make these things happen, but what about what you actually need to accomplish? I was serious when I say that you as designers understand your job. You understand what you do. You've run into, in some capacity or another, in one medium or another, um, what you know has to happen, and you've been stuck with trying to find fonts that can get to that spot, probably. Um, variable fonts make it possible to get some of these things done a little bit more easily. So here's an example, um, Adobe Myriad. Um, Myriad is a really uh, legible, clean typeface. Um, Apple used it as their brand typeface for a long time. It made Myriad really difficult to work with because it made everything feel like Apple. Um, but type is very flexible. You know, you make a small decision and it feels different. What if you could take the version of Myriad and just make it a little bit different of the weight? a little bit different in scale, it wouldn't feel like the Myriad that you're used to seeing. You could essentially make your own custom font using this technology. Um, and you could tweak that custom version to be what you need it to be. Um, with Acumen, like I was saying, you can play around with those. You can make Acumen feel rounder, more geometric. You could get that slant angle that doesn't really exist in other typefaces and make a unique, ownable version for your own projects. So you can get faster to the brand experience you want to build or the feel of a publication or a website or a digital property that you want it to have because more of the power is given over to the user to make these very fine-tuned decisions. Um, my colleague Bram Stein um, has been doing a lot of work with what you can do um, with that slight flexing of width that may be available in variable fonts. So if you work with justified text, 
you may have come across the fact that it often looks terrible. Um, you get giant word spaces or you have to stretch things in a really weird way that distorts it. So that algorithms that get justified text to work have very like straightforward versions like we see in web browsers. Now the red indicators on the side here show how much extra white space is thrown in between the words to get text to justify. So like on the web, you may get like really uncomfortable white spaces. InDesign uses a different algorithm that's a little bit subtler that also lets you squeeze, um, gives you a slightly different effect, but you still get all this additional stuff. Well, if you can get the letters themselves to flex slightly without actual distortion, you could actually eliminate those weird white spaces and get a clean, readable, easy pattern. Using the font technology, you could get type that just looks better, reads more easily, and is a nicer experience for someone who wants to see it. That could be pretty awesome if the tools allow us to take advantage of this. Um, that becomes even more of a compelling idea if you think about like looking things on a phone or in an environment where we have a really narrow column where you don't get those giant rivers, those giant white spaces, but you get clean, even bits of text. Um, if you do signage or work on any kind of digital screens and you think about like the properties of backlighting where uh, the whites tend to eat in on the blacks because of the light is shining through. So these are two examples of the same text on different backgrounds with the exact same styles, but it looks really spindly in the dark text in the light area because the light area is closing in on the dark. Well, with the variable fonts, you can just make a slight tweak and boop, it feels better. You can get those to feel the same, which is what they really need to do without having to jump up like a whole step in weight. Um, and this is the kind of like, small decision that we want you to be able to do because you understand the medium that you're working in that may need these like small decisions to be made as well as the big dramatic ones like with the branding stuff. I wave my hands a lot because I'm really excited about this. Um, this is a little demo that um, Isabel Lee, who's one of our Adobe creative residents, has been working on if I can get it to play, um, where she's been experimenting with kind of different inputs that produce effects with variable fonts. So here's an experiment where she's working with a light sensor on the camera of her computer to change the weight of the typeface depending on the amount of light coming into the sensor. I'm just going to run that one more time, have a look. Um, Isabel's been doing a bunch of fun experiments. You should talk to her down in the pavilion while she's around. Um, so all of this stuff is what we want to do. And I want to move to the next slide. There we go. And the other thing with variable fonts is all the experimentation really is happening on the web right now because CSS has a syntax for describing these settings for the different um, what we call the axes, these design properties of a given font. So you can attach a numerical value to things like the weight or the width or the optical size or custom properties that may be in a font. Um, and you can tweak this, you can animate this, you can do transformations in CSS the way, other way you did. And this is really easy to dive into now. Um, and this is why it's kind of fun because there's spaces happening all over for the work in this. So if you start layering in some of these ideas, so we've gotten responsive design which gives us all the ways to um, to tweak the reading experience based on the device, well, what if you add in what you can do with the variable fonts to add another layer of responsivity? What if you do need to, to tweak the width just so to get it to fit into a narrower column? Or change the optical size for a watch so it feels the same way it would on a larger design? Or tweak the weight just so because you've got like something like a Kindle, a different sort of screen reading device than an iPad or a phone? This, these layers of subtlety can, prov can provide solutions for real practical problems. That additional layer for you to do your work well is what I think makes the font technology really compelling. Um, and like I said, a lot of the experimental stuff is happening now because while we have to wait longer for the workflows to be built into desktop applications, um, you know, we can do a little bit in Illustrator and Photoshop now, but that's about it. But on the web, it's a pretty open playing field because you can manipulate things directly with CSS. So let's take a quick look at some of the stuff that's happening there. Um, 
first of all, I actually want to go back to this website. This is um, vfonts.com. Pardon me while I take a sip of water. So this is a collection of variable fonts that have been produced by different type foundries. Um, and you can quickly browse and see what's out there, see what designers have been making, and you can see what different controls you get for the different designs. And as you can see, it's not just weight, width, these sort of typical typographic properties. There's all kinds of different possibilities that type designers can play with to make available for you. And that's what's great about this site is that it's showing you all the experiments that the type designers are doing that allow you to understand some of the real sort of flexibility that could be enabled with this technology depending on what gets enabled. Um, my colleague uh, Wen Ting Zhang um, put together this site that's sort of another way of playing around with fonts that have been that have been made by type designers to experiment with what's possible. So you can check these out and here you can do some basic layouts, drag things around, edit the text, um, and then you can make different selections and again play with the properties made available in any of these and fool around. Um, Jason Pimentel is a, a designer who's been really thinking a lot about how the variable fonts can play into the practice of typography, the making of things, um, and he has some sample projects on his code pen site. And here is an example of a little layout that he put together. This is all done with variable fonts. So he's doing things like laying type over an image using live text that can be selected or scaled. Um, but if you watch as this page flexes, the type itself is also flexing at some of the breakpoints. Say the text is getting more condensed. So you're getting fluidity not just in the layout, but also in the typography. Check out what's happening in this headline as this flexes. That type is condensing to fit the container more easily. That's making for a really rich experience that's very responsive using this extra layer that comes from the typography. Okay, so please check this stuff out, play around, see what you want to do. Um, for, um, for our sake, the uh, my team has made some variable fonts available to you in Illustrator and Photoshop as of last year. There's a Minion, there's Acumen, there's Myriad. But we also have open source families, our Source Sans, Source Serif, Source Code families. And if you go to our GitHub page, Adobe-Fonts, you can get these fonts to download so that you can play around with them in web projects or other digital projects or test out what other software may have variable font support. So you can just go and download that stuff and play with it yourself directly outside of just that sandbox environment of Illustrator and Photoshop where, where we have the other ones. And you totally should. Um, the software is a big part of this. Um, the reason that I'm glad that people are experimenting on the web and that we're starting to get support in the desktop applications is that we rely on the software in conjunction with this font technology to make these things possible. Like I said, the, soft, the fonts themselves are not real software. They're files that have to interact with what other software can do. And I think that if the tools become more sophisticated for working with type, then it means that um, anyone who wants to set some type, whether they be pro, hobbyist, total amateur, they can get to a place where there's better type so that they can more quickly get to that spot of making creative decisions. That's the future that I would really like to see. So for example, I was showing an illustrator the demo of working with variable fonts. We have some sliders right now. That's good, that's a start. It allows you to play, make some settings. You can still copy objects, but it's not like a full workflow. There's not automation in there yet. It's not, there's nothing yet to do those sort of like justification experiments that I was showing or those like um, optical adjustments for like the light levels. Um, and this is a problem that killed some of the earlier precedents to this technology. I can't see the audience really well because of the lights, but is there anyone here who would have been old enough to remember multiple masters or GX fonts? That was a similar concept. There were fonts 25 years ago that could do this stuff, but 
this is what the interface looked like. Clunky sliders that spit out names that were difficult to remember and created bunches of versions of fonts instead of just having one flexible font. The difficulty of working with the technology, the experience kind of made it, um, made it a problem to take advantage of what the fonts could really do. And the possibility when it was introduced a generation ago effectively died because it wasn't made easy enough for people to get to the effective part, the, uh, the practical parts, the creative parts. Um, now our software is getting better at dealing with a lot of this stuff. Um, OpenType has been around for 20 years and I'm still teaching people about OpenType features. You know, and if you're not familiar with OpenType features, those are the alternates that you can have in a typeface so that you can get different versions of some of the letters or apply different effects. Um, Illustrator has gotten much better, for instance, about revealing what open type features are in a typeface to let you see, say, stylistic sets or alternates. You can get these contextual pop-ups that let you see what different variations there are for different letters. So these work even with things like open type SVG fonts, which are open type fonts. Um, InDesign has other layers of contextual cues. It'll show you samples of text you select to show you what else is in there with the features. This is really great. This is the software helping you understand what the fonts can do. So you can move along faster to do the sophisticated stuff that the fonts make possible. There's further that it can go. A little bit is very helpful. More is always going to be more helpful, right? We're doing some stuff uh, that's making it easier to work with fonts, which I'm really excited about. I don't know if you played around with the new versions of Illustrator and InDesign that were released yesterday, but um, in addition to better visibility for things like open type features, uh, the software is making it easier to actually find and choose and display fonts. So you can more quickly get to that point where you work with the type. So for example, if I go into InDesign, I select some text with a text box, and I go to the character menu, there's my font menu as we've always seen it, but look what happens as you scroll through the font menu now in InDesign or Illustrator. It can show you live previews of the text as you hover over it. All right, that's pretty good. You'll see that now the sample line that's in the font menu is the text that I had selected instead of just the word sample or something. Um, and you can go to fix samples to look at it in the menu or you can go to selected text and see that there so you can quickly check things out. That's pretty great. Makes it a little bit easier to more rapidly go through those font menus that tend to pile up. But if you click on the Find More tab, you can also now do that with the 15,000 Adobe fonts that are available for you to use with your Creative Cloud subscription. Um, so this is caching versions of the fonts coming from Adobe Fonts, so you can very quickly scan and preview and test right in the software. And if you like what you see, you can just click the activate button and it'll activate that, download the font onto your computer and it's available all of a sudden and applied to your document. But that's 15,000 fonts that you still have to scroll through. I've been like idly going through this while I talk about this and we're still in the A's. Uh, this is what happens when they don't come fast enough. Um, but so you can also filter. There's the similar um, fil filtration that we have on the Adobe font site where you can just shorthand go through sans serif fonts, serif fonts, scripts, just to shorten that list if you know what you're after. And that can apply to the fonts on your system or those fonts pulling down from Adobe fonts. Again, we want to keep you in the space where you make the decisions, help you get through like the rote stuff so you can practice more on the typography, the, the thing that you bring to the experience where you make decisions to make new things. Hopefully, that proves to be great for everyone. Let me get back here. Um, and in addition to that, there are all these other products that are coming up that even get you past that moment of like the what do you want to do. If you haven't played around with Spark, Spark asks you what would you like to create. This is different than opening up an InDesign document that just you know gives you like a page size and then a blank screen. 
literally a blank page to work with. Spark is trying to get you fat, faster to the place where you make a different kind of um, document and it sets some stuff up to help you get part of the way there. This is sort of that assist with the practice of typography. You can choose sort of a medium or a shape or a kind of project and it's offering up a few more potential starting points so that you can move ahead to the part where you're making something. You're adding your um, decision making and your creativity to the process. Um, and this is a really interesting idea that can probably play out in other kinds of tools and other kinds of software where it says, well, we know that there are a lot of, there are a lot of sort of conventions that you may follow for different kinds of projects. Let's set up a lot of these different variables that, that we have a pretty good idea you may be trying to do and get you to a different starting point to go forward. Um, if we go back to the play type website that I was showing before, um, you can also, if we have fonts that are doing more things, have more kind of flexible flexibility and variability, what about if we rethink the interface of how our applications let us play with things? Um, I'm probably going to have to choose a different typeface to do this. But if you um, see, even in this example, that's the wrong font to show this, isn't it? Let's get to Decovar. Decovar's crazy. Um, there's a different kind of um, UX here for showing how you may explore with this variable space. You don't have to necessarily choose each slider. You can like move around inside the space and get that to work. You can change some other things if you want, depending on what's in the font. And Decovar, for instance, has very crazy things. But you know that's a totally different sort of possibility of what's possible. Or what if the controls, let's do this, ba -ba. what if the controls of your text box allow you to adjust some of those properties, like the width or the weight, so that it's a little bit more instinctual. You move the object around and the object takes advantage of those properties of the variable font. Now this is an experiment because this is complicated stuff, but I think this is where more tools have to go. If we're allowing font technology that can do more and do interesting new things, I think that the tools have to evolve as well and let you move in a more instinctual way, keep you on the creative surface so that you're not playing with menus and options, but you're playing with your words. You're playing with what you're trying to make and interacting more directly with those materials. That's a future that I think is very compelling and that we should probably be trying to get to. And that's sort of like the bait and switch about this idea of the future of typography. Working as a type designer, I've had people ask me for years and years and years, what's coming next? What does the future look like? People want to know what it's going to like be style-wise, but really, I think the big question isn't how things are going to look. It's going to be, how should they work? You should decide what things look like. Type designers should think about what typefaces may be style-wise. You should ask type designers to make things that, uh, that look a certain way style-wise. And you should produce work with type that influence where things should go. New situations are going to define what things ought to look like. But the really interesting part of the future is how do you change the way you practice typography? If the fonts can do more and the software can do more, it means that you can create in entirely different ways and get to a different place in what you can make and you can make new things. And that is what I think is a more interesting future than trying to guess what people are interested in terms of style. What they can do is an idea that I'm pretty into and that I hope we can do some fun things with. Now, all this stuff that I'm showing looks a little bit all over the map, and I keep using the word experiment a lot. It's early stages. We're figuring these things out now. And what will really move the needle on what happens next is your interest, the interest of people who use the fonts, who use the software, in what do you want to make? How do you want things to work? I'm showing some possibilities. If you tell me and my colleagues at Adobe, at other companies, what you want to be able to do, 
that becomes compelling reasons for us to put the effort into making them work a certain way, making certain capabilities available. And I absolutely encourage you to do so because I want to do more with this stuff. Um, thank you. Um, I'm sure you're hearing this from everyone you uh, go see talks about. Please uh, take some time to talk about your thoughts about this session um, in the survey and your Max. And also tonight, don't forget about the Max Bash that's happening. Um, it's going to be huge and it's going to be fun, hopefully. Um, Beck is almost certainly going to be great and there's going to be all kinds of things you can do. And please, um, I'm going to be back down at the Adobe Fonts booth in the pavilion. If you want to ask me more questions, come catch me down there. See if you can grab me at the party tonight. I definitely would love to talk to you all more about this stuff and brainstorm about what the future can really look like. Thank you very much.